Friday, theaters, VOD, and iTunes. Um, let me introduce you to the novelist, Joe Hill. Joe. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the two stars of the movie, Juno Temple, <laughs> and Daniel Radcliffe. <laughs> Checks in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you little parcel tongue devil. <laughs> Thank you. What What is it about the allegory that Joe created in the novel that was then translated into the script that let you come back into the serpentine world of a uh, little biblical flair? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I suppose because Joe's world in and of itself is so. Um, you know, striking and real and exciting that there was never a moment where I was thinking and you know of course I think because Potter was such a part of my life I never think of the comparisons that other people might make or the, or the similarities that might be drawn um, but yeah I mean, the thing that attracted me to it was just the fact that it was so bold and so um, you know, heartbreaking and beautiful and the story and this guy's journey was something that you know I really connected to and I feel like the allegory of Turning into what you were perceived as, or feeling like an outsider, or being made to feel like an outsider, is um, is is very strong and something that I and hopefully a lot of people can connect to. Um, and yeah, there was just, as you said, such delight in bringing from style to the genre. It was and it was so witty at the same time, but being so dark. And the love story obviously is so funny. There was so much. Is it kind of fun having your reporters kind of attack each other at one point? <laughs> 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 yeah, absolutely. We're going to recreate that. Yeah, <laughs> 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 this is like what we're done. Um, yeah, no, they, it was, that's a great scene. Um, it's, it's, it, I won't lie, like, I took no small pleasure in, in, in <laughs> <laughs> the moment of, of catharsis. Um, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic, it's, all, it's one of the fun parts of the film as well. It, it's the, and, you, and it's great that you have all those great fun moments in the film because the film also takes some very dark heavy turns as well but the um yeah i mean it's that scene was, was i promise you i don't you know think of you all in that way but there are if i could sort of if i could hand pick five or six journalists from the uk and sort of arrange a cage fight I would. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Daily Mail? Um, who writes their headlines austin powers <laughs> From like 1973, yeah. I would have been knocking him dead if Burt Reynolds said it in a movie like 1973. But you know, that's that's what's so frustrating for me is that like the, the Daily Mail website is the I believe is the most trafficked website, news website from the UK, um, and yeah, it's you know so that's what a lot of people I think yeah. think that's how we think as a country, which I'd like to you know say is not the case. <laughs> Hi, uh, my question is for Joe. I was wondering, as the author of the book, if you could talk a little bit about um, the adaption. Were you involved at all? Any pointers on the screenplay? And what did you? How did you feel about seeing the film, either a rough cut or the final version? How close is it to? Do you think it's to the material you originally wrote? I, I think it's tremendously close to the book um, in 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 the most important way, which is. It, I think it's very true to the spirit of the characters in the book, um, and it's also it's also very true to the to the plot mechanics and to you know there's a lot of scenes right from the book that are in the film. But I think the most important thing for me was I, I hope that the characters would feel like the characters in the book that they would that, you know and and um, and and I think Dan and Juno and Max and and everyone you know brought so much heart and and so much ability to it that they you know that they really did. Um, bring those characters to life in a special way. Um, you know, there's two ways to like screw a film up when you adapt it from a book. Um, you know, uh, you can you can totally forget the source material and just run off and do a completely different story, and then it's kind of like, why did they even bother to adapt something in the first place? But you can also be so faithful to the source material that you wind up with something that's completely dead on the screen. It just sort of plods along, and, and you know, for a work of art to succeed. It needs to dance, not fly. And I think that Keith Bune, you know, did a terrific adaptation of the, his screenplay. You know, cut all the right notes, but it never bogs down, and 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 it covers a 
huge emotional range and does it with a very light touch. And, um, so, I'm, you know, I'm tremendously gratified. Um, Daniel, tell us about wearing the horns. Were they heavy? How long did they take to put on? And after a while, did they start to look normal when you looked in the mirror? They looked really normal and like really quickly. Um, and that was what was, I think, remarkable about them was that whenever you, uh, you know, you see a line in a script that says the character has horns, you go, okay, well, great. That could look, in my imagination, that's fantastic. But how would it actually look? So the first time I saw the model was kind of a combination of uh, relief they look fantastic and, and excitement. Um, because you know, when you have something stuck to your head, that can go either way. So that can look, that has the potential to look silly, and, and it really doesn't. And the word uh, organic is one of my sort of most hated, overused words. And like, oh, it's maybe it maybe organic, it's it look bad. but they do in that they are in that, in that they look like they're made out of organic material and, and actually coming from my head. Um, they only took about twenty minutes to put on. They were really fast. They were very light. Um, yeah, I mean, the makeup guys, Mike McCarthy and Mike Fields, who I, I, they are actually together again at the moment working on something. Um, they did my makeup for the job, and they did your horns when you came out. Yeah, I did the horns on for, yeah. for <laughs> And you know, they, they go so well with almost anything. You can, you can dress <laughs> up as you wear a t-shirt, but they accessorize nicely with, you know, formal wear. Um, so. they're, they're, we were coming up the other day with, sort of, if, if this was a longer story and it sort of went into the sort of mundanity of life, yeah. yeah, so they, they probably get used for like, oh, dry cleaning back and coat hangers and things like that. They're, they're, they're a very functional piece of network. I think a proposal with a ring on the Yeah, put a ring on it. Nice. Sorry. Oh, uh, guys, congratulations on this. Really, it's a phenomenal work. Not that I expect anything less, but um, going back, you know, here's what I found so intriguing is that just at the core of it, there's such a, a, a fantastic story, but then when you add everything else onto it with the horns and, and these fantastical elements, how much more intriguing did that make it to you? If that had not been there, would you still have wanted to, you know, do this this story? And, and separate question, kind of playing off of what you said uh, to, to Debbie about, um, you know, his perspective feeling like an outsider. I could even take that a little further and, and say, you know, it kind of these these indictments that people make, how quick they are to judge how much you could relate and, and feel that, and what you could bring from your perspective. Sure. I mean, I definitely think that. The, um, Magnifying the store things from your own life to to help uh, working as an actor. Um, definitely a theme in my life has been the gap between you know, how I'm perceived and who I know myself to be. Um, not that everyone, anyone's ever like thought I killed someone, but but the, you know the, the idea is sort of the principle kind of thing. Um, and you actually made a really great point about the story of this without all the other amazing kind of symbolic uh, visual elements to it. It's it's a great story and the story yeah. of this. This love story. love story being this sort of the the idealized wonderful love's young dream that then got to grow up and still be together, um, and the story of that falling away is of itself you know a, a compelling enough story. I think when you add you know when you add the elements of uh, the horns and the powers that the horns give him, um, that does that you know that brings uh, obviously an extra visual element of excitement, but also um, to me, it, I've always really enjoyed magical realism, and that's kind of how I view this script originally. It's just been the whole world is very, very grounded in reality with this one extraordinary, insane thing happening in the middle of it, which is sort of everything else is hurtling around. Gina, did you have a take on that? Yeah, I agree. I think very much that the story in itself was because me personally being a part of it, I'm not around any of the horns. You know, I Mary never meets the horns, she's never a, a part of it. But I think the love story to me was so important, and it was so important to make that, you know, in a sort of weird Romeo and Juliet kind of way where they're not ever going to be together. And you know that from the beginning of the film, but my God, you want them to, you wish that they're going to end up together, even though it's not possible. And so I think the, the horns for me added this element of, yeah, he's going to figure out what the hell happened to her. So it's almost like this blessing that gets added onto this great story that is a fantastical love story and something that I think everyone can relate to, you know, your first love that you feel so passionately, but it is rare that that continues for such a long time and could potentially for them, if it didn't all go the way it is, be a love story forever, you know, and I thought that was, um, that was a really, really great part of the script and something that was such an important base for this, like you said, magical realism. It is 
one of these fairy tale like stories where you get the, the, the wish you wished for and it turns out to be a curse. There is this moment when he says, I want to know everything. I want to know every dirty secret. It'll make it easier to hate you. Um, and, and as a result, he does learn every dirty secret of everyone around him. And it becomes this incredibly painful thing and, and sort of pitches him deep into a cry of hell. Um, he, does, he does eventually get Marin's confession. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he does, he does force the unexpected truth, get the unexpected truth out of her. He gets her confession last. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. And what's mm -hmm. great is it was written before he had the horse. Right, the yeah, yeah. The confession was already there. You know, yeah. She didn't have to have that forced out of her. Right. It was written for him, for him well, to find, yeah, that the horns yeah. weren't part of, you know? Yeah. They were so before. Yeah, that was, that's, that's real honesty, isn't mm -hmm. it? My question is Daniel. Uh, the EB is um, the parents uh, kind of confess you know, the, uh, your favorite less, less favorite child in the <laughs> quite isolated moment he was having. So how, how about yourself? Because being a movie star, uh, I don't feel you have experience being isolated. But as I guess sometimes you feel that way. So well, how do you think? I mean, everyone, how I think everyone thinks of actors as being like having just relentlessly glamorous social lives. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't know, I was never um, particularly, like, I've spent very little time in, in this city, um, and, you know, I, there is, I'm not going to, I, I never want to sit here and, and be the actor sitting here whining about being famous, but there are elements of it that are isolating, uh, as much as they are, as many opportunities and fantastic things as come into your life, there are also things that, you know, you, you have to struggle against. But I think there is a, there is a, um, you know, the perception that actors are kind of just at one long party all the time <laughs> is, is, not, is not quite the case. Scott? Um, for Daniel and Juno, I'm curious, is there anything that you saw in these characters in the script that actually scared you as far as your ability, like, how am I going to pull this off? Or I don't know, I don't know exactly how I'm going to get to this, but it'll be fun to try. Yeah. Most of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the whole. The whole thing, but I also think that speaks for every actor in, in the film. None of us had, you know, it wasn't a walk in the park for anybody. Each character had their own challenging moments, and some that were really dark, you know, and really made you feel uncomfortable. But I think that's the joy of being an actor is challenging yourself to do those things. It should never be easy, I don't think. Um, and I think that's, you know, speaking about Alex, our genre, who isn't here, that's the blessing of having a wonderful director that is patient. So loves actors that he will draw things out of you and push you to a limit that you didn't even know you had inside of you. But then when it's over, he's very gentle and helps you get, <laughs> helps you calm down afterwards too. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think we're very lucky. Actors are lucky that we have a job which becomes more fun um, as it becomes more challenging. Like it doesn't. We could do like a, a day of, you know, inserts on being open and shutting drawers and doing loads of stuff, and that'd be the easiest day of my life. But it wouldn't be any fun. Um, so you know, I, I definitely think there were there were a lot of moments of that. Particularly, I think uh, the breakup scene was one that I would. Yeah. It's not so much that you go, or oh, will I be able to do that? As you go, or for me at least, I go, we can't not do that right. Like yeah. that has to be that has to be perfect. And so it's not that you sort of approach some scenes. Maybe this isn't a good idea, but you do approach some things naturally with a, a sort of an extra element of this is particularly with that diner scene, which come you, is come back to you through several people's perspective and is a real key moment in the film. Um, you, you would just, but that's one of the great moments of like having a director like Adam, <coughs> like a scene partner like Juno, where you just can rely on those other people and all work off each other. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah uh, how, how reliant were you on Alex sort of for the tone of this? Because it does sort of juggle the, talking about like the news scene. Like that's kind of silly and fun. And then there's this other stuff. I mean, notwithstanding the murder itself, it is very serious. How reliant were you on him? And how difficult was it for you guys to sort of, I guess, nail the right tone of seriousness and, I guess, whimsy? You know, one thing which I think is interesting about Alex is he's, he's made a lot of really disturbing films, yeah. you know, full of upsetting sequences. and But he's. He's a real sweetheart. He has Gentle, very lush, romantic heart. Yeah, and, and I, I think that, I think even the most painful scenes in the films, you know, the basic romanticism of the man comes through. 
um, you know, that the film sort of glows and there's a real affection for the characters, you know, even when they're admitting to some, some really, you know, ugly, painful things. Um, there's a feeling that these people are, that the, the, you know, these people are cared for, that the, the storyteller has an emotional attachment to them. Um, um, so I, I think that's one of the most charming things about the film. I mean, I, I would also say, you know, very much for an eye in my eyes, it's kind of because that's, that's, I mean, that's, I think that was probably his biggest challenge on this film, and it's, and it's the thing um, that it's very nice as an actor to be able to go, I just follow your lead, you tell me what you want, and I'm, I'm guided by you. And also, when you have such trust in the director, there was never a moment where he would say something about a scene and I would disagree, so I wouldn't ever be thinking. There was never a moment, for instance, when I thought something should play really, really funny, and he should have pushed it to dark. Um, so, you know, thankfully, we were on the same page most of this lovely video, and I'll hand that over to him and nobody needs to worry about that. And he did really create, you know, like you're talking about, you know, the, the scene with us in the tree house. We were listening to David Bowie. He played it super loud. So we were actually having a great time, as you should in a moment like that. And then for me, with the scene in the forest, it was a polar opposite situation, where it was incredibly, you know, freezing, wet, dark, and you're in the thralls of nature, which no one can control. <laughs> um, and it was it was interesting because I felt like Alex was um, more so, uh, separate from me and Max in that scene. He would come over to talk to you about specific moments of direction, but actually felt much more lonely, which I, I, I really helped me because I did feel quite lonely and frightened that night, which is perfect. Whereas the night where we were shooting in the treehouse, or the day, I don't remember yeah. what time of day it was, you know, we were told just have a great time. You're in love, you're with a beautiful setting, make love and be joyous, you know? So it was, he definitely, you know, um, set up turns extremely for me, for sure. And I'm so thankful for that. Because it really helps you as an actor when you get put in a situation that you are taken out of your everyday life, you know? And I think a director is so, um, so lucky and so inspiring, you know, when they when they really get the opportunity to that they inspire everyone around them. And it's a great thing. I'm just curious about your experience working with all the snakes during the snake scenes. And also, Daniel, Hi, sorry. <laughs> also, Daniel, at Comic-Con, you mentioned your excitement for Sharknado 2. Yeah. And I'm just curious if it lived up to the hype. It totally did. It was fantastic. <laughs> I, I met, and then like a day later, I met Tara Reid and uh, Ryan Deering over the course of the next few days and was able to wax lyrical about Because I just, I have a real affection for films like that. And, and with the second one, like they knew even more, like they were even more self-aware and knew more what people liked about it and were able to make it bigger and louder and sillier and fun. Um, so yeah, it was great. Uh, and what was the first part of your question? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry, uh, about working with the snakes. Yeah, they were fantastic. I actually, I didn't know uh, before doing the movie if I was uh, comfortable with snakes. Turns out I'm extremely comfortable with snakes. Um, they are, I may have been completely projecting human emotions onto this creature, but I became completely convinced that she was very affectionate by the end, and was in fact, because she was like, they get cold. They get, snakes aren't cold blooded. This was my favorite word that I learned on the street performance. They're, poi they're poikilothermic, which means they can't control their body temperature. So whatever temperature it is outside, they will be. So they're freezing, and they're, you're really warm, so they just love you, and they just like hug you, but not in a <laughs> constricted kind of way. Um, so yeah, I really like them. Uh, we had one scene with 100 live snakes, Awesome, um, but uh, yeah, talk to Mac Miller about snakes. He's he's not such a fan. <laughs> yeah, he's a snake. He's he really, snake really hates them. Yeah, yeah. Agree. And, and yeah, and he had to work with them all the time. Yeah, we do too. Yeah. It's, it was rough, I think. That just was good. Yeah, but then again, then. Cool. Thank you. Hi, Dean. Hi, Juno. Um, in this movie, um, your characters are also played by um, actors at a younger age, mm -hmm. and it got me to thinking of what Jodie Foster was talking about on her country track um, contact of how her performance was informed by Jenna Malone, who played Elio at a younger age. And I was wondering if you had a similar experience with that, or if it was the other way around. It was interesting because we didn't really see a huge amount of mm -hmm. what the kids were doing because um, you, for me, often I would often would find that. Yeah, yeah. I had to go back and forth. Um, and, and I was often, when they would be doing stuff, I would be getting made up or demade up or something would be going on, so they would try and time it like that. So I didn't really get 
can see a lot more of what they're doing. Um, I got to spend quite a lot of time with, with particularly with, with Mitchell um, on the movie, and it was funny because because um, Sabrina mm -hmm. is from LA, mm -hmm. I think, and who plays the young. Well, she lives here. Yeah, she yeah. lives here, and she is just the most like she's thirteen, going on twenty-one. Like she's yeah. like incredibly yeah. mature and well above her years. And Mitchell is like I was when I was like <laughs> he's a kid he's from Winnipeg, and he's like a, a, a kid, and and um, he's must be like forty. Incredibly sweet, really, really quite cool. Actually, he, he saw house, me yeah. join the Barker Cullen <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's grown up a lot now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so, uh, but no, he's, he's awesome, and um, uh, I, I just like this, the fact that, because obviously Mitch is blonde naturally, he's got much fairer hair than I do, and they dyed his hair on, on the first day, and he went back to his hotel in Vancouver, and they, nobody knew what he was doing, and one of the girls in the conception said, oh, you look like Harry Potter. And it's like, oh, it's amazing today. I'm so happy. That's great. So, um, yeah, no, it was, it's a very hard, it's a very hard job on the casting department to cast somebody to play a young me when everybody knows exactly what it looks like at that right. age. And they did, I think, like a pretty good job. I think it was a brilliant job. All of them. All of them. Young Stephanie. Young Stephanie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The kids all worked out at Florence Handshake. I don't exactly remember oh, what it was like. Oh, did. It was, it was, it was, yeah, it was as, it was as like you fist bump, you end. Yeah, yeah. with the horns and stuff all the time. But they were, the kids were a lot cooler than all of us. <laughs> oh, yeah. They had the metal with the Daniel, is there just a direct through line from learning your lines as an actor to actually being a good and efficient rapper? Just wondering. If <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think so. I don't know if the two are connected. Um, I mean, maybe the fact that I like learn lines a lot uh, helped me learn that song, but um, I, I don't know, because I, I do take things in, um, like or, uh, orally, AU orally, um, and sort of uh, very well, so I think it you, you was initially just by listening. No, I don't know. You probably don't know, you haven't even seen, we just been on the planes since last night. Yeah. Yeah. I went on the talent show and did that last night. Yeah. You had six months. It's become the thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite, imagine, it was it was amazing because I got when, like I got to I said in an interview ages ago that I, like there was one of those things like what what tell us something we don't know about you and I've done a million interviews so I'm really struggling at this point to find something you don't know about me so, <laughs> I, so I thought, well I know all the words to alphabet or but back a little and then Rob the uh, who always talks who always produces me on the uh, Fallon caught me up when we were doing press for what if and was like could you do that on the show and I was like oh I I I, I, I I'm, I don't know, I sort of freaked out, but then when we came to do it this time, it was like, the Roots really want to do it with you. So I was like, okay. But then what I didn't realize was that I did the rehearsal, I went and did the rehearsal, and then Questlove came back into the dressing room and was just like, yeah, man, I'm going to text those guys, they're going to be really excited, I produced their second album. So I was like, oh, okay, you like are friends with these guys. So I'm like, I might not have been as bold as to suggest it had I known that, but I'm, I'm amazingly glad I did it. I was like shaking with uh, adrenaline for a couple minutes afterwards, which was awesome. <laughs> Um, considering how many of you are, are British, was there ever any discussion of just letting you be British, or was the, the setting that important to the story that, that you had with some Americans? I think we were, we were like that. I never got to be British. No. 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 I do think it's interesting. It, was, it made it yeah, like, interesting that we're all doing British accents, and of course, my normal source of like, when I'm doing the accent, I normally go to uh, the director. How's it sound? Of course, he's French. He's French. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just saying, oh. so it was Kathy, my old producer, who's over there now, who was the person that I was always being up to. Like, does this sound okay? Can you use it? I think in the last couple of years, it's become clear that if you want someone to play an American, you have to hire someone to play one. <laughs> 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 you know, you can't tell them. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. And, and, and Dr. Garfield, Peter Parker, yeah. and, you know, Kira Knightley is so great when she plays an American. Yeah, and, yeah. You know? The other thing it's a British invasion. The other thing that was interesting about uh, us and our American counterpart who played the younger versions of us was that Alex wanted one shot of us because he had this shot that he filmed before we all got there of the three kids, uh, Sabrina, Dylan, and, and uh, Mitch, all riding bikes through the forest. And uh, and then he was like, I want to recreate that. You with all you riding bikes in the forest, uh, you know, ten years later or whatever. And neither me, Juno, nor Max Minghella can ride bikes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, which I which I would never admit to normally, but because we're, we we can admit to it together, it makes it yeah. a lot less weird. Um, we also but, yeah. 
Although we're getting close, we both pass our theory to our permit test. On the same day, right? The same day, yeah. 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 Ready yourself, Eric. <laughs> 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 this is the genome. 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 I was given once, which was find it always buy a, when you buy a car, buy a car you feel comfortable sitting in traffic in. Um, and so, you know, I think anyway, you always, if you're in a Ferrari in traffic, you're not going to look cool. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I really did enjoy it, and it was, it was also very cool getting to see, you know, see me go into a river. That was also awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, my main purpose through all the driving scenes was just don't break the car, don't crash the surface. You know? Like, because I, I mean, had to drive into this woman's driveway and like she had loads of lawn ornaments and stuff and, and I you know it was not good. Hitting a mark in a car is a horrible thing is if you're not good at it. Especially because you know that all the other men on set drive, so literally everyone on set is just going, I oh, can you guys do this? Can you just let me do this please? Because he can fucking drive it. Like yeah. <laughs> he's screwing it up. Um, it was so yeah it was definitely uh, it's not my favourite but I'm 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 taking my test at the end of the month. You don't drive right now. Test. No, and he had to drive with the snake yeah. on his neck. I that was actually one of my favorite uh, moments from any film that I've ever done. Was I was we had this one shot in the movie where the, the snake is I'm driving along, the snake's around my neck. I pull up, get out of the car, walk over to the cop car and have to do a scene with them. Um, but we couldn't. I couldn't drive with the snake around my neck because the snake like latches onto the gears of the steering wheel and stuff. So you like that's annoying. <laughs> and so um, so. We had to have somebody in the back of the car who would put the snake around my neck before I got out. But they had to like hide down at the back of the car with a python. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, it was, uh, and Brad, who was our snake hand 
well. I mean, maybe I had had um, I had a wooden leg. Um, most of one of his legs wooden, so it was very hard for him to get into the back of the car. So that job had to get delegated to somebody else. It's not normally the state hand department. And there were Corey, who was our one of our set deck guys, and he just um, I remember him getting into the back of the car with a snake and us getting to our first position. And I just turned around to him and I was like. Tell him, I'm like, Corey, just so you know, I don't have a license, like, I don't drive. Um, just so you know, you know. And he was like, Oh, it's fine, I've never handled snakes before. <laughs> <laughs> In any other industry, it probably wouldn't have happened because there's money being thrown at it in this film. It's like, no, go, 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 it's all we have to do. It's great. So it was, it was, you know, I, I love the moments like that are what make the film industry the best film in the world. Very good. Uh, Juno, you talked before about um, Alex creating a environment in the tree house scene, but the, the love scene, was it a bit nerve wracking as you guys approach it just between yourselves? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think, like, it's it's just easier when you get on with the person you're doing with. I've, I've been fortunate and I've never really had to do, certainly never a scene like that um, with, with somebody I didn't know. Although, like, on, it was definitely like on Kitty Darling when I was doing the scene. Was your first female set scene? But like on, on Kitty Darlings, the, the character who my character had sex with was not like a principal character in the film. So as much as like I got to know Olin, who was the guy, a little bit, like it was still very nerve-wracking because essentially you just met for the first time <laughs> and now that's what you're doing. Um, so it was like definitely this was a, a much better experience, like having got to know somebody a bit further. Yeah, and also I think, especially when it's an enjoyable scene, There's, there's like this emotionally intense sex scene, and there's this like lovely sex scene, yeah. and that was kind of one of them, I guess. And the voice of the like, yeah, listening to Bowie. Yeah, listening to Bowie. Sounds <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, we were discussing about this. It's, sex scenes are so technical, you know? It's so, it's almost just like another day in the office, weirdly. I think it's very much. And I think we both don't quite have the industry to kind of this yeah, it's as like, well. like, so it's not as like, I was really nervous for my, my first ever one, but you, you do, you know, not to say you get totally blase, but yeah. you know, it gets, it's just like, it's part of the job. Yeah. Um, time for two more, Scott. Um, both of you guys started out acting at young ages, and you certainly have like an innate natural quality on camera. Do you remember when you started consciously trying to bring like some craft to, to the things that you were doing and going, and kind of growing up as actors and, and finding your way? I remember being given a piece of advice when I was doing Atonement by Joe Wright, there was a scene where I had to really weep, hysterically weep as Lola, and I couldn't, I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it, I couldn't cry, I couldn't cry, and then suddenly I went and sat in the corner and, you know, my 16-year-old dark teenage self found everything inside of her to get cat catatonically upset about, and I weeped and weeped and weeped, and then I couldn't stop, and we cut, and two and a half hours later I was still weeping hysterically, and Joe said to me, you really need to learn to understand your character and get upset about what the character is upset about. So you don't have to draw from your own heartbreaks, your own sadness, your own things that make you, you know, go to dark places so that you wreck your mind for the rest of the day. Definitely those things should be present. But that was something that I really learned and I, I really enjoy that now of getting more into the head of actually being the character and really understanding why they are upset in that moment and not just being like, I need to force cry, I need to force cry, you know, because it just becomes much more fluid. That's something I really remember and I think that's a craft thing. Okay. I mean, yeah, absolutely, that's great advice. Um, I mean, I, I think it's very, very gradual for me and in like several different stages and you know, still going on. Um, yeah, it's always going on. Yeah, so it's constant learning, isn't it? But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think 14 was probably the age where I was first like, okay, I wouldn't really have a go at this and I wouldn't really do this for the rest of my life. Um, yeah, um, and I think you're old enough to know that by then. Um, and then, really, I don't think that I got any uh, sort of solid technical grounding until I, I had, um, uh, was preparing for the darlings, really, I mean, just after how to succeed when I, I was, that was when I was first taught how to like, break down a script. Um, Thing is, it's, a, it's a constant learning process, and that's the joy too of what we do. Is you're never going to be the best you can be. You're never going to get an A star in this. You can 
always, always keep learning, always keep being open. And the best research you can do is listen and learn. You know, it's like being a sponge for life because you never know when you're going to get to use it. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I could not be more impressed by the uh, choices you both made in your careers. Obviously, huge mega blockbusters for very small, very interesting indie films. What are the main things that go into your decision making process these days for whether to get involved with a project? Um, for me, it's just uh, will I get to do something I've never done before? Um, am I you know, excited about people I'm getting to work with? Uh, but those are those are the two sort of things I guess at the moment for, for me. Is it you know will I get a chance to do something new? And 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 who am I doing it with? That's that's it really. Direction is really important for me. I really. not one specific thing. I, I definitely I, I agree with you with the idea of something new, something that's a challenge, something that takes you out of your own body, because that's just the best experience, especially when you get put into your new hair and makeup look and your costume, and you literally zip on the skin of another human being. It's so thrilling to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.